Hello, my name is Hassan Huntar. I'm the author of uh, Man at the Airport, and I am ready to start digging deep. I'm Mark Sutcliffe, and I'm on a quest to learn from the best. Welcome to Digging Deep, presented by Zen Books and Abacus Data. On Digging Deep, we seek out people with really powerful stories and lessons to share about life and leadership. On this episode, the remarkable and inspiring story of the man in the airport, Hassan Alcantar. So in 2011, Hassan Alcantar was working in the United Arab Emirates when a civil war broke out in his home country, Syria. So he decided not to return to Syria even after his work permit expired. That meant he was living illegally in the UAE for several years. He was eventually arrested and deported to Malaysia. He then tried to travel to Ecuador, but airline officials wouldn't let him board the airplane. So then he wasn't allowed to enter Malaysia, but he also wasn't allowed to leave the country. So he was stuck in the airport in Kuala Lumpur. And he was stuck there for seven months. How did he survive in that airport? How did he eat? How did he sleep? And how did he eventually get out? It's an incredible story of resilience, of perseverance. It is also a story about the power of social media. Hassan eventually started sharing his plight in a series of posts, and that led to a Canadian woman, Lori Cooper, fighting for his freedom. And Hassan eventually moved to Canada in 2018 as a refugee, and he's been living and working in British Columbia. Hassan tells the whole story in a new book called Man at the Airport, How Social Media Changed My Life. And he shares much of that with us today. It's an incredibly inspiring story about hope and optimism, but it's also about some very practical things like how he tackled both big problems and small problems and the very deliberate and calculated approach he took on social media. All right, one last thing before we get started. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to Digging Deep and post a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen and share this podcast with your network. And if you're looking for more information on the podcast, please go to letsdigdeep.com. That's letsdigdeep.com. Now, let's start digging deep with the inspiring author of Man at the Airport, How Social Media Saved My Life, Hassan Alcantar. Hassan, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to Digging Deep. Uh, two years ago, you and I were part of the same event, uh, an event for Refugee 613 here in Ottawa, where I live, um, uh, called The Kindness of Strangers. And you gave such an inspiring speech that night. I'll never forget how, how quiet the audience was when they were listening to your story. You, you, they were just completely caught up in your story. And I've never forgotten that. And I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to speak to you again and to talk about your wonderful new book. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me again. It's such a pleasure meeting you again, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, I get that that reaction normally when I speak uh, before the pandemic. <laughs> now it's always virtual, so it's it's like I'm speaking to myself. But when I had the chance to meet people in person, I got that reaction from them: uh, empathy, sympathy, and they are uh, in the moment. So yeah, yeah. Well, it's an incredible story that we're going to get into, but. Uh, let's start with, and you know, I, I ask these questions so often of people who grew up in Canada and had a very have, have had very different life experience from yours. So I'm really interested to hear your your answers to these questions that I ask every guest. Uh, but what is your fondest memory from your childhood? Uh, our olive farm. Your olive farm. Mm -hmm. Tell me a tiny bit about that. Uh, I. Uh... The experience I got from the olive farm is what helped me through the airport time. I knew that life is not about instant results. It doesn't work that way. And it kind of remind me of uh, the relationship between the farm and the olive tree, the farmer and the olive tree. Uh, he will take care of the tree. He will plant it and wait for four to five years before he got a single olive. Uh, and that's what life is all about. If you are looking for an instant results, 
it's not going to work and you will give up and you will be full of disappointments and depression. So you need to wait, you need to be patient and you need to dream about the day when the olive tree will start giving you olives. Wow, that is so profound. <laughs> Thank you for that. That's Thank really you. interesting. So who was your hero when you were 10 years old? My father. Okay. Who, you've, you've lost your father. I lost him, then, right? uh, I lost him uh, at New Year's Eve 2016, and I was in United Arab Emirates jail at that day. And it, well, it's one of the most darkest and lowest moment in my life. Uh, I was in a cell all alone with no uh, bed. It was only a uh, floor with two blankets, one as a mattress and the other one as a, as a pillow. And there was a small window, 20 centimeter by 20 centimeter. And I could hear the firework, people celebrating New Year's Eve, and I could see the lights. And, uh, but the most bizarre thing is that through the iron bars of my cell, I could see the phone but I could not reach it. And all what I wanted is to call my family to check on them. Uh, and I tried the whole night uh, um, trying to reach the phone, but I could not. And uh, uh, even uh, while I was writing the, uh, my book, uh, it was uh, one of the most hardest thing to write about this. I remember myself writing a line towards, then I will go for a walk. Then I will come again, write a line or two. I will have a shower or a cup of coffee. I felt myself, my body was shaking, uh, sweating, and uh, oh. it, was, it was even hard for me to remember it. Of right course, now. of course. What did you think you were going to be when you grew up? Uh, to be honest, I was thinking of being successful, not rich. Uh, it never crossed my mind to have uh, enough money, uh, enough money to be stable, but uh, uh, to be a good uh, member of the society, that's all what I wanted. And uh, okay. to enjoy my life and uh, uh, to add something. And I always felt that. I don't know if that makes sense to many people who are listening, but I always thought that... Uh, I'm different or something is going to happen in the future, but I did not know what it was. And I was waiting for it. Even during my seven years being illegal in United Arab Emirates, uh, my friends used to tell me, what are you waiting for? You are in a deep, deep, deep problem. And uh, deep down inside myself, I knew that I was waiting for this thing, but hmm. I didn't know what it was. Wow. What would you say is your life story in six words? Uh, contradictions, hope, hopeless, power, powerless, family, Syria, Canada. Okay. So say that again, hope, hopeless, power, powerless, family, family Syria, Canada. Okay. For what do you feel most grateful? People, humanity, individuals, and for social media, believe it or not. Social media. Yeah. <laughs> It's a big part of your story. It is. It, it what saved me. But I understand uh, it's, it's only a tool. It's up to us how to use it. It could be, like in my case, it could be a, a lifesaver or it could be a weapon of mass destruction. It's up to us. And I know how people are, uh, they have this uh, stereotype that it's a, um, aggressive and uh, not a friendly environment because people are hiding behind fake names and photos and pictures and uh, start uh, spreading all this negativity. Uh, I don't think it's the truth. I think the majority of people are good, but they decided not to engage. Hmm. Yeah. And that's the difference. That's what's going hmm. on. What would you say has been the best year of your life so far? 2019, uh, the, the year I stuck at the airport because I rediscovered myself and I become the man I am, I am today. So you would describe your time in the airport as the best, best year because, because of what it led to and because of who you became as a result of that? Exactly. I understood that uh, who you become during uh, your march towards your dream is more important than the dream itself. And for, for years, I was uh, 
full of shame and uh, I, I failed my family, I failed myself, I failed my people and um, uh, my life was taken away from me and uh, I could not have anything to be proud of. Then all of a sudden I found myself in a place where I can uh, tell my people's story and I become proud of what I'm doing. So at the end of the time I was at the airport, I did not care much uh, about what's going to happen next. I uh, I fulfill my dream or my goal. I I refuse to go down without a fight. Mm. Uh, um, the, it, it may, may people may argue that this year is the best year of my life because I had my book. I have a very good work with Red Cross. I have uh, I get what Canadian called. I get finally after years and years. I get my shit together. But I think it was the, the year two thousand nineteen because okay. I think of this will happen. I, I love what you said about who you become on the march toward your dream is more important than the dream itself. That's sure. really profound. What has been the toughest year of your life so far? Uh, it, it, there have been some very tough moments, obviously. So what would you say to that? 2011, when the Syrian war started, and I found myself uh, uh, facing uh, uh, a decision no one ever is ready for it. Uh, it's a life or death decision uh, to be to participate in this war, to be a part of a killing machine, to kill your own people or to destroy your house or not to and be in the opposition side and make yourself ready to be the ultimate prize. And uh, I, I, I did not see my family since then. And I have been in jail in two different countries. And uh, so, and Till now, even now, when I'm in this amazing place in Canada and uh, as a member of this great community, uh, society, the Canadians, I still dream about the day where I can wake up and have a cup of coffee with my mother or uh, watch my, uh, play with my niece. I did not see her yet. Uh, Or my sister-in-law or my nephew. I, uh, I, uh, I saw my nephew once in my life. He was there three months old now he's 13 years old wow so yeah I, yeah so what one person has had the greatest impact on your life my father and my mother i believe they gave me the necessary tools i used at uh, the airport and uh, somehow i feel that they knew when i was a kid that i'm going to face some difficulties in my life otherwise i cannot understand why mother uh, my mother uh, sent me each and every summer to an English school. Uh, I, I did not want to. I wanted to be outside playing with my kids, or with my, my, sorry, my friends. But she would use any necessary thing <laughs> to send me to an English summer school when I was a kid. So my late father, when he used to take me to our farm to prepare me physically, then grab a book each and every night and read to me in politics, history, literature. Wow. So, so they prepared you well without knowing what the future held. Um, What's the most important lesson that you've learned that you would share with other people? Given up is a result. We hear that people say given up is not an option. That's great, I cannot agree more. But we miss, uh, but we should know what is it. If it's not an option, it should be something, it cannot be nothing, but we really don't think about it. We all uh, satisfied with the first part with given up is not an option, but that's great. What is it that I believe mm. it's, a, it's a result for us not trying enough, not believing in what we are doing, for us giving up as quickly and uh, not be in love with what we are doing, or for us asking for an instant result. Wow. What do you think people would be most surprised to learn about you? Um, <laughs> uh well i i don't know i don't i'm i think i'm in my late 30s i'm still single for a reason uh i feel shy around women you're shy okay that's okay um what's the scariest thing you've ever done facing the system facing the system uh i i have been uh, if at the airport, uh, imagine this, not seven months at the airport, then uh, followed by two months in detention jail. During the seven months at the airport, I was uh, under civilian, uh, under control 24 hours, and they uh, under investigating. They were investigating me sometimes seven to eight times a day, each time for an hour or two. So, uh, And I was 
alone with nothing but my mobile and they were a government with yeah. their law enforcement, with their media outlets, with their um, virtual army and embassies, ministers. Yeah, and we can come back to this, but when you, you were when you decided to start sharing your story publicly through social media and drawing people's attention to it, you were taking a big risk, obviously, because I was, they knew exactly where you were, right? True. That's why I was facing the. I, I yeah. said I'm facing the system because uh, I think the mistake they did is by not making me disappear for the first week. They did not. They were not smart and clever enough to understand what was going on. And so I got them by surprise. So. Yeah. yeah. And then it was too late, basically. Too late, yeah. yeah. What book are you, you've written a book yourself now, but, but is there a book that's had a huge impact on you? Is there a book that you recommend to other people? That's an Arabic, actually. I, uh, my my uh, uh, my reading is still limited to an, uh, to Arabic uh, uh, literature. Um, uh, it's something I wrote about it in my book. It's called uh, because I lived in uh, the Gulf Peninsula for eleven years. There's we have one of the most greatest uh, authors in the Arabic world. His name is Abdurrahman Muni. Uh, he's Egyptian. He's dead now. Uh, he wrote this uh, 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 novel. It's called uh, the Cities of Salt. Uh, Cities of Salt. Yeah, and okay. uh, it's 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 about uh, uh, the cities of the Arabic Peninsula. So. I find that very inspiring. Okay. I, I know some. I, I know a lot of. Uh, I even I, I read I read the, the uh, international the national uh, novels, uh, but it's uh, an Arabic translation, like right. Gabriel Semarkis or Dan Brown, or, or or. But it's all in Arabic language, so it's translated. Yeah, Cities of Salt by Abdul Rahman Munaf. Is that yeah. right? That's right. Okay. All right, Hassan, thank you for answering those questions. We're going to take a short break. And when we come back, we'll continue digging deep with Hassan Alcantar. We're just going to take a quick break so I can tell you a little bit more about the presenting sponsor of Digging Deep, ZenBooks. ZenBooks is Canada's go-to cloud accounting firm. They are not your typical accounting firm. I know the founders, Colin and Eric. I've worked with them for several years. And here's why I think you should consider working with them, too. First of all, they bring a fresh, unique, modern approach to what is a very old-fashioned industry. These guys were working remotely and in the cloud long before it became cool. ZenBooks also uses technology to your advantage. I think this is really important. They give you the tools and analysis you need to monitor your business in real time. That's so valuable right now when everything changes so quickly. Yes, they're a virtual accounting firm, but that doesn't mean they're offshore, and it doesn't mean they're inattentive. ZenBooks combines the efficiency and effectiveness of a cloud accounting service with all the benefits that you'd want from a trusted advisor, high-level advice, and strategic support. Now, here's what I think is going to happen if you work with ZenBooks. You'll probably start out taking advantage of their cutting-edge cloud accounting solutions. But in the long run, I think you'll stay with them because of their strategic guidance and problem-solving. Among their core values, they specifically list being candid and proactive. Isn't that exactly what you want from a trusted advisor? Look, even if you're already working with an accountant or a bookkeeper or you have some accounting staff on your team, I think you should still talk to ZenBooks and learn more about their tools and their expertise. Check out ZenBooks at zenbooks.ca. That's zenbooks.ca. Digging Deep is all about helping you make better decisions, and so is Abacus Data. Most leaders struggle to connect with and engage their audiences. Why is that? It's because they aren't sure how they think and feel and how they will react. Abacus Data can give you the strategic insights you need to make better decisions and to make them confidently. Here's a good example. A major national union was recently negotiating a new agreement for its thousands of members. This had the potential to be a very difficult process. There were many competing interests. 
So they brought in Abacus Data to conduct thorough and detailed research of their members to learn exactly where they stood, what they were thinking, what they wanted. And as a result, they were able to secure a strong new deal that was accepted overwhelmingly in a national vote. Abacus Data helps all of its clients understand what's really happening in the minds of their employees, clients, and stakeholders. They help them avoid costly blind spots. And they're really good at what they do. In fact, Abacus Data was one of the most accurate pollsters in the 2019 Canadian federal election. Make the one decision that will improve all of your other decisions. Let Abacus Data help you move forward with confidence and clarity. Go to abacusdata.ca. That's abacusdata.ca. Once again, Hassan, it's such a pleasure to be talking with you again. Um, I, I wanted you to talk a little bit about, as you've already done, your childhood in Syria and the Syria that you knew as a child, because I think today so many of us outside that part of the world know it as the Syria that has been engrossed in this horrible conflict for so many years now. Um, but when I have spoken to other people who grew up in Syria, um, they describe obviously a very different place uh, from what we know today. So can you talk about the Syria of your childhood? Mark Twain once said, uh, Damascus, it's a type of immortality. Damascus is a type of immortality. Okay, I didn't uh, know that. It's the oldest inhabited city on earth. Uh, each and every known empire by the history tried to take control of Damascus. They all left and Damascus stayed. And that's the legacy of us as Syrians. Uh, huge, deep, rich civilization, um, uh, full of different minorities, ethnic and religious minorities. Uh, diversity was there. And uh, what people don't know that the majority of the Syrian people used to be from the middle class. Um, and those are the provider of the society. Uh, doctors, engineers, lawyers, sports, uh, artists, it's all from the middle class. And those are the refugees this time because they understood that it's a short life, it's one life, and we need to live in a peace and uh, quietness. So the majority, even from the refugees now, are from the middle class. And that's why we see difference in the new countries we are going to, that Syrians are thriving because they have they had the faults. And uh, we people who take uh, education very seriously because it's not a rich country even before the war. So we knew that science and education is the only weapon to face the future. Uh, mm. And um, so that, that's a misconception that I think a lot of people have, right? When they think of a uh, refugee, they think of somebody who is, is living in poverty. And, uh, but in fact, Syria had a very robust middle class. And many of the people who have come to North America or to Europe or to other countries as part of this refugee crisis that's played out over the last four or five years, they, uh, or longer, they, they came from the middle class and they're starting uh, over now in these other places, right? Exactly. Uh, well, he, uh, here's the thing. It's the stereotype. and It's the effect of media and social media. And that's why I wrote one of the messages of the book was uh, uh, to correct all this misunderstanding and uh, to set the record straight that um, when you think about Syria, it's not a, a destroyed buildings. It's not a refugees and refugee camp. It's not about vulnerable, hopeless, powerless, uneducated, unskilled people. It's uh, quite the opposite. Uh, they are skills uh, uh, workers. They are educated. The most of the so many of them are speaking uh, speaking one or two languages. Uh, they um, they can be an additional value to any community. All what they need is um, uh, is uh, an opportunity. But 
what, that's how I started my book to, uh, uh, to bring some lights on our history and our habits, who we are. Uh, yeah. When I came to Canada here, I, and when people uh, ask me where I'm from and when, after they uh, sadly, uh, not sadly, mistakenly think that I'm from Mexico, they will, uh, the, their first impression will be, are you from Mexico? And I will say, no, I'm from Syria. And when I say that, uh, I will start finding the reaction, the, they will shift their uh, reaction. Uh, Oh, sorry. And you will start feeling the embassy and the, 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 the sadness. And uh, um, they are trying to, to show their uh, condolences or whatever. You yeah, say. their compassion, right? They are compassionate. Yeah. So, uh, but what they don't get is that Syria is something different. A very proud nation. Hmm. And it used to be a safe place and secure place. And, uh, and that, that's what Canadians in general don't understand. And that's yeah. what, why uh, we as uh, refugees or new immigrants can bring a new type of understanding, or new ideas to Canadians to understand that things should not be taken for granted because you weren't having it. Yeah. Uh, so, and I want to come back to that, actually, uh, the perspective that you would have that so many of us who grew up in Canada would not. But um, I, uh, let's talk about the, the decision that you had to make at a certain point, because uh, Syria was embroiled in this internal conflict. And it, as you described it earlier, you had a choice between basically becoming part of what you called a killing machine uh, or... Uh, standing up against it and and potentially losing your life in that fight, right? Um, that's a a horrible decision to have to face. And and th what you chose to do was to leave the country, right? I was outside the country at the first place, but I decided not to go back. Right. Um, but uh, you were working I, already outside. I, the I country, was right? I was working outside and since two thousand six until two thousand eleven. I was working in. Uh, in Dubai, and uh, my, my career was booming. I was uh, a branch manager for an insurance company, and uh, I had all the kind of life, all the pleasures I wanted. And then uh, it shifted for, since 2011. I lost everything. But um, I think there are so many factors in the decision why I did not go. Um, some of them are personal, others are political. Uh, all what I was dreaming for uh, is a country where you can speak out your mind, where you can have uh, uh, a free journalist. Uh, one of my biggest mistakes, and uh, something I regret in life, is not to study the thing I love, for example. I spent five years in Damascus University studying something I never liked, which was law school, uh, uh, to be a lawyer. But I, okay. I, I, you yeah. went to law school in Damascus, yeah. Yeah. but you but weren't interested in that. I hated every single day of it. What I wanted is journalist. But I found my father sitting with me one day and he said, well, there's no journalist in Syria. What are you going to do? Uh, mm. And that he knew that well, it's a dictatorship. They are controlling everything. So uh, I, I could not study the thing I love because I knew that okay, well, under this regime, there's no, there's no chance I, I, I'm going to be a journalist or something I'm proud of. So I left Syria. But also, there was not a clear enemy in the Syrian war. Uh, um, yes, there are some uh, international uh, forests, superpower forests, uh, like uh, countries who are uh, showing interest in Syria and involving directly in the Syrian war. But it's still the funding, the base, uh, the Syrians are fighting each other. Uh, so they are using us. So there was no clear enemy here. And there's no outside, outsider. And that's why if Syria was invaded by a foreign country, I would go and fight for my own land and my own right. people. But that we were fighting each other. And then I thought uh, again about our uh, olive farm, that uh, the way I, I have been raised is to build, not to destroy. It's not a part of my, it's not my purpose in life uh, to, to carry a machine gun and start shooting. That's not why I'm there. I believe in, not in peace and uh, love, because people sometimes uh, uh, mixing peace with being coward. If you're right. a peaceful man, they will take it. Uh, I think it's quite the opposite. Uh, those who who uh, choose such choices in life, like being peaceful or uh, in love or kind, they are the bravest and the smartest. 
Uh, so people in general, they mix being peaceful with being coward. I think no. Uh, and I proved it later on at the airport when I start facing the system. That, yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, um, I decided so, not to go. Yeah. So you decided not to go back to Syria. You remained in the United Arab Emirates uh, beyond your, your permit, right? For yes. your, your visa for being there. Work, work permit. Your work permit, and uh, which effectively made you uh, an illegal resident in that country. And then, um, and then you tried to travel and you ended up in the airport in Kuala Lumpur. And that's, that's where you know, this story really, I mean, I, I know it begins much before that. You were, it was seven years, right? That you, before yeah. you ended up in that airport. Um, during that time, you know, what, did you feel like you'd lost your country? Did you feel like you had no home? It's uh, weird how uh, the, the, the human mind works. When you leave your country for a long period of time, your mind will, uh, the time will praise for you at the right. time of your country. Your mind will erase each and every bad or negative memory about your country and it will start sounding uh, as the perfect place on earth, the most beautiful. That's how right. the human mind works because it's your home, it's your country. So when the Syrian war started in 2011, uh, uh, as someone who left five years before that, I could not believe that those are the people I left six years ago. And this is the country I left five to six years ago. And that it, um, it's a trauma. It's a, um, a complex, uh, uh, mental and emotional and ethic com uh, complex. And uh, I, I was in denial for uh, just a small period of time. And I thought naively that uh, we can stop this. And uh, it's never too late, uh, but uh, I was wrong. And uh, I did not know at the time I took the decision of not participating in the war that this is going to happen to me. I thought naively that the regime, we will change the regime, we will be a free democratic country, and then I will go back to Syria. Or even if he stayed, he will stay for three, four, five months, a year, then the international community will come and remove him. But um it's 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 the, the idea if we are going to dig deep how you at one period of your life think that you own your destiny and you can make it then out of a sudden you don't own your destiny anymore and it's controlled by people who are fighting over power individuals and that kept happening to me for the next nine years. Yeah. At Malaysia, when I was trying to go to Ecuador, I paid 2,000 US dollar, uh, the price of the ticket. And then he decided, the Turkish airline supervisor at Kuala Lumpur Airport, he decided not to board me because I'm Syrian. He is an individual who is thrilled. He was thrilled by the power he has to determine my life and to set a new course for the rest of my life. An individual with the little power he had, he changed my life. So I did not own my destiny anymore. Same, same happened in C Cambodia when they sent me back. And individuals, uh, same happened in the United Arab Emirates. So that's my problem with the system, with the story in general, that individuals with a little power in their hand are able to determine your future and to tell you what to do. And whatever they are offering you, somehow they are trying to tell you that this is your right and only your right and you should take it and be thankful for it. So th this is what, what I think about it. Yeah, that's very compelling because you lost your freedom and your freedom was in the hands of individuals, not just governments, but individuals, as you describe it. And now you have, and now you have your freedom back basically. As sure. you, you're in, you're in control once again, and we'll get to that part of the story, but you're in control of your own destiny again, but you lost it for so long. I lost for almost 10 to 11 years. And, uh, 
uh, all the time I was looking at them, all the time this was happening to me, I was looking at them and I was thinking that I'm a better person than this and uh, this should not happen to me. And uh, uh, during different uh, phases in my life, I end up finding myself in handcuffs when I was convinced that I'm not a criminal. And uh, I have been treated like a criminal, but I did not know what my crime was. And this is when I start developing the question, the, the, the main question. And when I find the answer, I, uh, it was uh, 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 no more a problem for me. I, the same question I asked uh, the authorities in the United Arab Emirates, uh, the Turkish airline, the Malaysian authorities, the Cambodian authorities, the same question. I said, would you do the same if I was uh, holding a USA, Canadian, uh, Europe, or Australian passport? And when I discovered the answer that, no, they will not do the same, uh, they are doing this because I'm Syrian, it was uh, no more about Hassan, the person, the individual. It, about, it was about uh, the Syrian. Uh, right. And, and I, I start you. understanding that uh, people when speak about when we speak about racism, for uh, for example, we identify it as a, uh, we speak about uh, color, religious, uh, gender, yeah. race. Uh, I think there's a fifth uh, uh, racism that's a geographical one, and uh, being born on the wrong side of the world. Yeah, I've heard you use that term before in interviews, and I find that fascinating. That that sort of discrimination based on country of origin, basically, right? Uh, and based on the passport you're holding. So what, let's talk about the experience in the airport. So you, you intend to fly to Ecuador, you're not allowed to do so. And then basically, for the next seven months, you're in this airport in Kuala Lumpur, and you can't leave, right? You can't even go outside and, and breathe fresh air or feel the sun on your skin. Uh, can you just describe what that experience was like and how you lived day to day? I, it's kind of interesting because um, it, there, there's a, I'm not comparing in any way your experience to what Canadians are going through in the context of the pandemic, but, but there's, a, there's something parallel there, I think, in a way. There's a, there's a, a connection there of just suddenly you know, all of your movements are limited and you're stuck with this reality and every day is almost exactly the same as the previous day, right? True. Um, at the airport, uh, you will find yourself uh, facing two kinds of problems, the small ones and the big one. Uh, the big one, the main one, is how to get yourself out of the airport because this is not a normal situation. So you start working with that. But uh, you end up with a lot of time facing your uh, small daily problems, things you never thought that it's an issue, it become a major issue. And uh, it began huge during the first month. But if you give yourself the time, if you did not panic, breathe, cool down, you will start finding the keys and you will start solving them. They, so they will not be a problem anymore. Uh, how to sleep, when to sleep, how to take a shower, when to take a shower, how to clean your clothes, where to dry them, uh, how can you get some privacy, where is the better connection, Wi-Fi connection, uh, what, uh, what are the shifts looks like and uh, what time this uh, plane land or take off uh, uh, the different uniforms at the air for the airport staff and uh, what does it mean each one of them and uh, the investigations uh, all of the time and uh, uh, you are facing I was you will start developing a sense that you are facing uh, literally the world a lot and uh, it's everywhere. And uh, so you're facing the world alone, basically. Yeah, you're, it's uh, you uh, against everything. Uh, everything. Yeah. Every, nothing yeah. is working in your favor. And uh, when you try to uh, to seek some reasonable or logic uh, solutions, like contacting NGOs or UNHCR, which is the United Nations Refugee Commissioner, they we are uh, the purpose of their existence, and they come back to you with an answer. Uh, uh, Sorry, we cannot help you. Uh, turn yourself into the Malaysian authorities. They are going to uh, contact the Syrian embassy, get you a ticket, and send you back to Syria. So. Uh, at that dark moment in your life, you knew that I knew that, oh, okay, I'm in a deep, deep, deep problem. And uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is my main battle in life. 
uh, this is uh, this is this is the great game I'm having uh, having right now, and um, you will start understanding life uh, uh, from a different perspective. Uh, uh, so tell was... me more about that. What what did you what what did you gain from that experience? What perspective on life did you did you develop that that I couldn't possibly imagine having not been through that? When. Uh when they sent me back and that was the day I stuck at the airport. That was my first day at Malaysia airport. At that day I was at the morning, I was at Cambodia airport and they sent me back to Malaysia. Uh, at, at the Cambodia, uh, at Cambodia airport, when they said we are not allowing you to enter, I remember myself uh, uh, lying on uh, my back to the wall and collapsing. And uh, I was looking up. I don't know if I was speaking to God or super power or call it whatever you want. But I said, uh, and I could not move at that moment. I said, well, this is too much. Now what? Because at that, new, at that particular moment, I knew that as Syrian, I tried all options. That's it. No more options. And they sent me back to Malaysia that day. And that was my day one at the airport. So we say as humans, so many things uh, we don't mean to in our daily life. And it become uh, like a figure of speech. Uh, how many times do we say, I hope so? I hope so. Yeah. How many yeah. Do we really hope? Do we really understand what hope is? If we uh, do, then we should understand what hopeless means. Um, I, hope is the main motive behind life. A hopeless man cannot dream, cannot wake up in the morning, cannot work, cannot love, and he has nothing else to do in this life. He's done. That's what hopeless is. I uh, don't think so many people felt that. And uh, uh, to be powerless, uh, vulnerable, uh, to want to shout out, but no one understands or no one is listening to you. And then uh, all of a sudden you start understanding and developing after the media storm that uh, what, a, what a powerful individual can do. Uh, because at the same day of my media storm, all of a sudden you and UNHCR showed up at the airport and they inducted an interview with a translator they managed to have an access to the international zoo to the duty-free zoo uh, when they say to me as individual as hopeless powerless individual before the media they told me as individual powerless and hopeless one turn yourself to the authorities right and then when i had the media and people start speaking about me they showed up at the interview and said, you are now a refugee and here's your card. Mm. And it made me feel, uh, what about those voiceless people around the world? And, uh, right. and uh, uh, during, the years, during the years, people took away my destiny and controlled my destiny. I'm once again in control of my own destiny at that moment. And to start developing that life is about priorities and life is about balance and uh, nothing will surprise me anymore and yeah. at that moment I, I i stopped being afraid i feel like you saw the best and the worst of people during that experience is that is that fair to say there were people who were incredibly kind to you but you also saw the other side of that as well right true, true very true yes I can tell you hundreds of stories about uh, people who try to take advantage of it, but uh, I will never generalize. Uh, they are just a small uh, amount of people who saw an opportunity and who uh, they are normally seeing an opportunity uh, in everything. I believe they are what we call survivors. Uh, people sometimes they mix up in my mind. I think there is difference between survivors and fighters. And uh, they will tell me sometimes their reaction will be, you are a survivor. I no. Survivors, they will uh, they will um, they will make an opportunity out of everything. They don't mainly have a code or principle uh, to live by uh, they uh, they care about their own interests and their own profits and uh, those are the survivors uh, hmm. 
I think fighters, they are the people who have a principle, they are proud, they have a dignity, and uh, they live by that code. And uh, people sometimes may call them a, a, an old school or idealistic. Or, uh, 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 but I believe that I'm a fighter. I fought. I did not say right. I, I fought. So you're, you're describing survival as more of almost like a, a basic kind of scrambling, you know, do whatever it takes just to just to get to those, the next day, as opposed those, to fighting yeah. with a principle. Yeah. Not to misunderstood. People who are uh, facing an ordeal in their life and they are going through it and they manage to go through it. Those who are facing, they are fighters. They, they are not survivors. They right. are fighting for it. Yeah. So all of them who are out there fighting for to solve their problems, they are fighters. They are not survivors. Survivor, they, I can tell you stories about people who reach out to me and try to uh, to cut a deal with me when I was at the airport. I could make some money when I was at the airport. Wow. But I refused to. I said, I'm telling my story. I'm not saying it. And I thought that um, I, it will be me trading my people's blood and story and the tears of mothers and uh, the misery of kids, of the Syrian kids. So that was the principle I'm telling you about. So wow. Yeah. But you also signed credible kindness. People gave you uh, food. People gave you uh, other resources that you needed to to continue uh, to live in the airport under those very difficult circumstances. Um, I wanted to ask you though. There's there's this concept that that many business people will know of from a business book called Good to Great. It's called the Stockdale Paradox, and it's based on Admiral James Stockdale, who was a prisoner of war in Vietnam. And the idea is that how, how he got through that experience was maintaining a level of optimism that he would get out of that situation, but also uh, confronting the reality, the brutal reality of the current circumstances he was in. And I wonder if it, it seems to me that that applies to you and how you handled the situation as well, that you always had this dream of getting out of the airport and getting to a better place, but but you weren't wildly uh, optimistic and hopeful about it. You were you were grounded in the reality of whatever you were facing day in and day out, and the and the small problems and the big problems you had to confront. Is that the case? That's true, but I think it's up. Uh, it's it's up. We are who we are, and I'm uh, by nature an optimistic person. Uh, and I, I used when I was younger, and even through my teenagers' time, I used to laugh a lot and be funny, and uh, uh, I cannot carry a lot of sadness. Uh, so I, I used to face it with an, like an irony or a sarcasm uh, as a defense mechanism. So uh, I will find always a way to mock life, the way life used to mock me. Uh, I remember when I was at the airport, uh, used to sit on a chairs with a view to the runway, and uh, it, uh, they, uh, uh, there was a Asia Air uh, Airlines. And, uh, with the Asia logo, Air? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, with the logo printed uh, on the, in their planes from, from <laughs> end to end. Now everyone can fly. That's the logo I used to see uh, a thousand times every day. For now seven. everyone can fly, which of course yeah, is not which, true uh, because I you couldn't. To, yes, and I, well, you should add ex except Hassan. And except then Hassan, life, yeah. Except Hassan. <laughs> and then again, life mock. It's mocking me right now. I'm a, a former Syrian refugee who, who his goal was to cross the borders, any borders. And immigrations and law enforcement officers used to be the enemy all time. And now in my deployment, I'm working on the Canadian and uh, USA borders with a thin line between the two of them and side by side by, with immigration officers. So uh, it's, it's kind of the way it marks me every time. And I try to find uh, the fun part out of this. Yeah. When I was in jail in Malaysia, I, uh, um, that's when I start actually developing my, uh, uh, the, the concept you spoke about geographical racism, because it was a, an overcrowded cell, five meter by six meter, with an open bathroom, an open shower, no privacy at all. And we used to be 40 to 45 people in that five to six. Uh, and most of them 
all of them actually are people from uh, uh, countries in Asia like Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan, India, uh, poor people who solved everything in their home country to have a work permit. And they came to Malaysia with the hope that they will start something new. Then, then they find themselves, uh, they will be deported back to their countries with nothing in hand. And wow. I was just to look at them and said, how can I be uh, complaining when I know that I'm, 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 I'm uh, I, now or even after six months, I'm ending up in a country like Canada. What about those people who are, who did nothing wrong except voting on the wrong side and they are leaving? If, imagine, that's a hypothetical question, but if we gave them the option uh, to stay at a cell for six months, to stay in jail at six months, and to be at the end of the six months deported to uh, Canada, or to leave tomorrow to your country, what choice would they take? I, I think see- they, they would take the six months. They would take the six months and, and, the, and finishing up in Canada. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and you know, it's interesting you say that because I, I think of your story as uh, you can look at your story through the lens of luck from a couple of different perspectives. You know, you were obviously incredibly unlucky to be in the situation you ended up in, in the first place. But the outcome of the story, once you were in that situation, in a way, you were one of the lucky ones because there are people who don't get out of that situation, right? There are people who don't survive. There are people who don't make it to Canada. People who don't have, you know, you had a phone and you were able to use social media to your advantage and it worked out. Um, and, and, and you were able to, you, be, as you mentioned, your, your mother insisted you learn English. So you were able to use that to your advantage. There are so many people who, whose stories we have not heard, who never made it this far, right? Well, that's the thing. And that's why I think even we make our own luck sometimes. Uh, I have a question. Uh, do you think that I was, and that's because you said luck, and we, we, when we say luck, we jump into some superpower are evolving in our life, and we just got lucky. I don't think that applies for everything. I, I admit that I'm lucky, but we have a different uh, understanding for luck. Uh, we made our own luck sometimes, and especially in our main battles in life. Do you think I'm the first one who stuck at the airport? Of course not. Do you think I was the last one I stuck at the airport? No. Uh, so far, after I arrived to Canada, I dealt with 26 cases of people who stuck at the airport. Now people, when they are stuck at the airport, they reach out to me immediately. Of course. Why did I do it when others did not? And that's what uh, I wrote in, at the end of my book. It's not the story. It's, the story is not unique. It's not the story. It's the way I handle it. That's what makes the difference. But what made the difference in my story? I did not complain. I did not cry. I did not shout. I was not full of anger, complaining and uh, blaming everyone. I was explaining and I was controlling my behavior, controlling my myself and uh, trying to, to show people the good side of Syrians. So I was someone with a purpose and I was serving that purpose. And I ended up being lucky because I was patient and I have the courage to wait for seven months on a chair, and that's not an easy thing to do. So when it said luck, I may agree if we agree that we uh, manufacture our own luck sometime. Absolutely. Um, I I could put it another way, which is to say, all I was trying to say with that is that you're one of the people who made it out of that situation when so many don't, right? So, So please tell me more about you know, this is this is where I think your story gets really interesting is how you use social media, how you did choose, you know, you made a lot of decisions in those circumstances for how you were going to manage your situation. What what did you learn from that? What are the lessons from from how social media saved your life? I've heard you you put it that way before. It's in the title of your book. Yeah. Um, and and, you know, what what you what you applied to that situation in order to to actually get out? Uh, By understanding that social media is not the purpose, it's the bat. It's just the tool. It's It's the tool. 
it's the tool, it's the road we are uh, walking in towards our goal. So the social media itself is, it's not, uh, it's not the uh, the goal. And uh, don't get, uh, get involved with all the negativity or the comment you are getting uh, on, on social media because that's a waste of your energy and it doesn't matter who win that uh, war. Uh, uh, it, it, it's just, it will just uh, uh, take your energy and your time and all your uh, uh, forests towards your main battle in life, which is to get yourself out at the airport in a place where you can call it home. Uh, I was never a, a social media kind of guy. And um, but I knew that when I tried all uh, reasonable and logic and official uh, solutions and it did not work, that's when I told myself, okay, we are going to make it the American style now. Let's bring some noise. And the noise, uh, the noise in the 21st century is social media. But I gave it a lot of thinking before I started my first tweet. You I, thought a lot about it before your first tweet? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and I explained that at the book. And uh, I knew that people, they have their own misery. They have their own daily problems. And uh, once they start watching me, they will uh, uh, just find another crying, hopeless, powerless man who is seeking help. And uh, they will uh, just uh, uh, switch the channel. Uh, so I tried uh, to bring smiles to people. And uh, to show them that even at the airport, in unusual circumstances, you still can be a normal person. And that's who Syrians are. So I was not trying to victimize myself, and, uh, uh, but to normalize myself. And um, uh, not to complain, but to ex explain. And I was not complaining about uh, the, the Syrian war. I was explaining what was going on and what Syrians are facing since 2011. And I got help from others, not to forget that uh, and uh, when the uh, when the media storm started and all the interviews and social media i got help from others from journalists and people i remember uh, uh, our uh, my lawyer um, he's okay, and there's a very uh, fa very fun fact about uh, about canada i will tell you in a second my lawyer mr andrew power here comedian um, he once uh, called me and he said uh, can you uh, reduce the media a little bit? Can you calm down? And I say- Do less media. You were, yeah. He was saying you were doing too much media. Too much social yeah. media. Yeah. Uh, well, he's a lawyer and he's seeking solutions and they need to turn off the heat a little bit sometimes. Yeah. And, uh, to, to seek a, a solution. And uh, I said, if you think that I'm in control, sir, that you are sadly mistaken, they own me now. And uh, copy based, uh, they, they owe Hassan. It's, it's not about me anymore. And even famous newspapers, uh, copy based, they never called me. And uh, they never. They were just copy me. and paste copy what you wrote. Paste. Copy yeah. paste. Uh, what other media are uh, saying as well? So yeah. I was not in control. Right. I was under. You, you couldn't head. just turn it I, off. It was. I, it was. I could not. Yeah. Too late now. And, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, I cannot do anything about it, and that's the social media reality. But sure. Uh, but uh, but I think what you said that's really interesting is you you chose, um, and I'm trying. You know, I'm I'm looking at this through. Uh, you know, the, the human lens, not, I don't want it to sound too much like a marketing thing, but I mean, you chose to tell your story in a certain way that you knew would resonate with people and would draw their attention to you rather than in a way that would turn them off. Right. And you could have, you could have complained about your situation. You could have, you, as you said, you could have victimized yourself. You could have made, you know, and, and that would not have attracted the attention you, you actually, uh, to an extent, you made yourself into kind of this really interesting story, a novelty almost, that then drew everyone's attention to you, and that gave you the power that you needed to make something happen, right? Yes, true, because I knew that if I were, I'm going to complain or cry or try to play on people's uh, compassion, uh, that would not be me. That would be an act that, that would be a lie. It's not me. I, I face my problems with a smile and uh, I, uh, I uh, seek goodness out of uh, each situation. And uh, I look into the half, uh, the full half uh, uh, of the glass. I, I cannot act it. Uh, so, uh, and I knew that 
on my back, there's the Malaysian authorities and in front of me, there's Syria, uh, Syrian regime or jail or death. So I needed to protect my back as well. And so I tried hard not to provoke the Malaysians, but it happened anyway. Uh, and uh, so I was in a situation where uh, enemies are uh, surrounding me. I, it was all over the place. So I was seeking escape i was seeking a place but i also wanted to act clever because i knew that there is a greater uh, purpose to serve here which is telling the syrian story hmm. uh, yeah i felt the responsibility that it was not about me only it was about syrian so and i'm now in a position where i can tell the world what's going on and so i need to act with a resp- uh, in a responsible way and not to start shouting and complaining and being angry from everyone but to uh, uh, speak some logic and uh, um, just tell people the world what what was going on uh, yeah. in my personal story and in syria and by doing that you turned yourself from powerless to powerful Right, you you were able to 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 you had it. You were certainly created enough power in that situation to to eventually cause change to happen. Right, I turned myself from Hassan, the uh, vulnerable, powerless, hopeless Syrian refugee, to Hassan with a global citizenship. You can mm. call it. because of individuals from all around the world who started. Yeah me sending me and i felt protected and i felt powerful because of them so i become more hassan the global citizenship than the, uh, the, the hassan the syrian refugee and that was the turning point of the story and uh, individuals they don't know the power they have uh, we, we can we can uh, individuals uh, normal people uh, they can change life while enjoying their life in their living rooms right now by using social media you don't need to sign to write a sign and go outside to protest anymore you can create the wave while you are uh, cooking uh, the <laughs> big and uh, they have the power they ha- they are the source of all authorities and they can put some pressure on government especially governments who listen to their own people so um, uh, I think that's a great point because it, it's too easy to dismiss social media because of all the negative aspects of it. But it is such a such an empowering and democratizing tool if it's used properly. Right. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. So uh, people, you know, I know a lot of people will already know your story. And if not, they can read more about it. We're not going to we're not going to tell every single detail of, of what happened. But when you were finally able to leave the airport, um you made a i think you made a phone call to your mother if i'm not mistaken and and then you were able to get on an airplane but can you just what what did all of that feel like you hadn't even been outside for seven months and now you were nine months yeah and 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 i mean you would have been in this airport watching people fly all over the world every single day and you you were stuck where you were what did it feel like when you made that phone call to your mother and when you actually were able to leave the airport where you'd spent so much time uh when i was at the airport uh, about to board on my plane to canada uh i phoned my mother and uh, it was the first phone call in two months because in detention they, jail they did not allow me to make any phone call uh, so uh, i said uh, <laughs> uh don't cry Otherwise, you will make me cry, and I don't want to be uh, weak in front of the guards and uh, immigration officers who are escorting me. Uh, she cried anyway. She did not say much. She said, uh, I love you, and I miss you, and I'm proud of you. And she passed my, the phone to my siblings. And uh, for the first time in years, I felt a genuine happiness uh, from my family. Uh, uh, for years, uh, they were. I saw nothing but tears, but this time I saw some real, genuine smiles, and that was priceless. And when people ask me about Canada, this is what Canada is. It's that phone call. That uh, phone call to your mother represents I, Canada to you. Yeah, well, that's priceless to see my mother smiling after years of years of. Uh, uh, crying, fighting to keep her family together, to protect her uh, her kids, and uh, uh, to uh, 
to make her proud of me and uh, that now I'm in a place where I can call it home and it's not just a place, it's Canada. Uh, so uh, that's when I uh, start I uh, Canadians uh, when even when the pandemic hits and we start panicking and that's when I wanted to people to understand that life is not about only about what we want. It's also about what we have. So uh, while we are working towards what we want, let us try to enjoy what we have, because what we have is the impossible dreams for millions and millions around the world. Well, that, that's, you know, obviously the perspective you would have, so the things that we take for granted every day in our lives are the things that you were dreaming of when you were in the airport, right? I was dreaming for two months. But my dream was to get a cup of coffee. And that's what people are getting for granted. I, uh, each day I was telling if there is a cup of coffee and a cigarette, things could be easier. But I could not get even a cup that. of coffee and a cigarette. Yeah. <laughs> that was the dream each and every morning. Yeah. How simple is that? Uh, people, they take things for granted, things they never think about. But I would love now uh, if they can close their eyes and, and think about it. Not to be able to control when to turn off and on the lights in your room, when to sleep or when not to sleep, when to have a breakfast or when to have a shower or not, to control the, your, the, the temperature in your room, uh, to control when you will be able to watch a movie or to make a phone call, and to make a coffee or add some sugar or milk to it the smell of a fresh air, the sound of a bird or the, to see a tree uh, and to, or to drive a car, uh, to do every small thing, to, to dry or to clean your own clothes. Uh, to, uh, that's what people don't get. And, uh, nothing is for granted. And if the pandemic has something good, it, it is that it reminds us it's nothing for granted. In a matter of two weeks, when I used to live at Westlat, when this pandemic started, I said goodbye to all the friends I made in two years. They went back to their home countries. And I found myself yet again saying goodbyes to the people I loved, the same way I said goodbye to my cousins and my family in Syria and never saw them again. So I sat with myself the first week, second week, and I said, I should know better than this. Nothing is for granted in life. And uh, I start dealing with the pandemic from that perspective. And if the pandemic is having uh, something good on it, it is that it brought the whole world one step closer to understand refugee. Yeah. Living like a refugee. The whole now, world can understand now a, all a little bit better what it's now, like to be a refugee. Yeah. All borders are closed now. Yeah. And it has been and still closed for refugees. All airplanes are forbidden for us now. And they have been and still uh, forbidden for refugees. All our passports, uh, despite the color, the nationality, the flag are equally useless. And they have been and still equal, uh, useless for refugees. So th th that's why that's we, a great don't, point. Uh, th we don't need to panic about it because at least. Uh, yeah. So what, what do you, you, you have a life now in Canada and you, you, um, have, you have a bit of a purpose now, I think, because of the experience you've been through. What do you, uh, what do you appreciate most about living in Canada? Um, because you've, you've seen, you, you've been, I know I read a thing about how you really, you'd go outside every day when it was snowing. <laughs> you, sure. you got yeah. to experience that, which, which, um, would be unusual for you, of course, initially, but like, what is it that you appreciate most about being in Canada? Well, we, I have the funny uh, answer and the real answer. Uh, I think, uh, uh, thank God for Canada. And uh, I could not be more uh, grateful and thankful because Canadians are different in general, and this country is different from the rest of the world. And uh, uh, the nature of people are different. And, uh, um, I think, I think, uh, well, here's the thing. Uh, three months ago, uh, during my uh, first uh, day at work, to, uh, I was uh, working a deployment with Red Cross, and I accidentally, during the first day uh, at the border, I accidentally crossed the border uh, to USA. Uh, I was using the GPS, and it led me to the USA side of the border, not the Canadian. And I found myself surrounded by Homeland Security people, and uh, they asked me, uh, where are you from? And I said, and that was three months ago. I said, well, uh, I was trying to be clever about it. Then I said, 
because I knew that there will be a problem. I said, well, I am uh, a permanent uh, resident of Canada. And they said, no, where are you from originally? And I said, I'm from Syria. And uh, when they knew that, and uh, they, they kept me for like two hours with the full investigation, they scanned the car. And uh, so one of the questions they asked me was, uh, why did you apply uh, for Canada, not USA? And, uh, uh, I said, well, uh, I don't think uh, we have a choice as refugees, but if we do, then no refugee on this planet will choose any other country uh, uh, other than Canada, because Canada is the dream. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, where we felt uh, safe value, uh, where we start understanding democracy and uh, independent judiciary, and uh, people, we start having voice. It's a place, uh, as I said, uh, before ruled by uh, uh, by laws and uh, guided by kindness, that's uh, um, it's the absolute beauty, even by natural uh, the, the people there and uh, um, the support I get from all the Canadians and uh, from my employer as well. That's uh, I enjoy each and every second of it. Whenever I have a disappointment day here in Canada or some rough days, I remind myself about priorities and. Uh, that all what I was asking for is a place where I can call home, uh, being legal, uh, to drive without looking above my shoulder, and uh, where I'm not being hunted uh, by, by law enforcement or immigration, uh, a place where I can feel myself, my voice, my rights, and practice them, and have work, a decent work to support myself. And I got all of that. Uh, wow. Well, why should I complain about the small things? I know they are there. And I know that every national debate here in Canada is a teachable moment for us because uh, uh, we read about democracy, but we never practice it. I'm almost 40 years old and I never, ever voted in my life. Uh, so I'm still a toddler when it comes to democracy. But here's my, my experience is uh, unfortunately subjected and limited to dictatorship. And that's why I'm telling Canadians that based on my knowledge, what we have in this country is not perfect, but it's so damn and close. Because, mm. because not I, perfect, but close. Yeah. And, and someday, uh, I presume you'll be able to vote in an election here in Canada for the first time in your life. Wow. Sure, sure. Yeah, amazing. Uh, you must have thought, by the way, during that moment when you accidentally crossed into the United States, did, did you think for a minute, here we go again? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I said that. And uh, um, it's like law enforcement, they all read from the same, from the same manual, from the same book. Uh, they yeah. all same attitude and somehow someone convinced them that they are the first and the last uh, defense line. They are not ideas and thoughts are now uh, crossing the ocean onto the uh, cyber uh, cyber environment. It's, it's on internet and uh, a danger coming from within, not from outside. And uh, mm. Um, but uh, um, they were polite, intimidating though, but I was not afraid of saying what I was thinking of. And I say that to them, no one uh, would choose uh, any other country over Canada. And, uh, um, they did not like it. <laughs> but, <laughs> Interesting that they even asked you that question. Um, yeah. yeah. Because they should know better that the time I was there, there was a travel ban on Syria. And I told them too, I said, yeah. I'm not expecting you to be an educated person, but this is your line of work. This is where you should, this is your, your expertise, where you should know that Syrians have a troubled band since uh, the last administration took place and was at the office. So I, even if I uh, applied for USA, I could not be there because you should know as an immigration officer that there is a troubled band. Yeah. He did not know anyway. Hassan, this has been so fascinating. Is there anything else that you want to, to share? Anything else you want to say before we wrap up? No, I, I just need you to thank you for the opportunity and uh, to thank uh, all the listeners for their uh, uh, precious time. I hope I added something new uh, to their uh, uh, experience. And uh, yeah, I love them all. And well, I cannot, wait, uh, cannot wait to be in Ottawa uh, soon, hopefully. Yes, I, I well, you know, uh, I went back and looked at... Uh, we exchanged emails after we sure. were at the same event and I went back and looked at them and 
we talked about the next time I'm in Vancouver or the next time you're in Ottawa that we'd get to see each other. And of course, because of what's happened, <laughs> we haven't been able to do that, but I still look forward to whenever that does happen. Thank you so much for this. Um, your story is so inspiring, but you also have so many valuable insights that have arisen from that, that, that really, you know, challenge our thinking in so many ways. And I'm very grateful for that. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. But thank you. There's so much that I loved about the messages that Hassan shared. Who you become on the march toward your dream is more important than the dream itself. And that theme of the olive tree and what he learned from that, it's just such an incredibly moving story. So once again, a big thank you to Hassan Alcantar for joining us on Digging Deep. If you enjoyed this episode, please review it. Please share it with others so they can hear it too. All of that is going to help us produce more great episodes for you. And if you want to keep digging deep into topics and lessons like this, or see the show notes, or subscribe to our weekly newsletter, or read my blog, you can do all of that at my website, letsdigdeep.com. That's letsdigdeep.com. And get ready for more great stories and powerful lessons on the next edition of Digging Deep. Thank you for listening. <laughs>